there are some seats here in the front as well. Welcome everyone. Uh, so I will be talking from the things that never change. So I will be talking about the fundamentals of cognitive psychology and I'll be drawing some lines towards how we do build websites today. My name is Simo Hellsten. Uh, username is Simo Hell sometimes with dash fi in some places where the username was already taken. Uh, I'm a full stack developer at Druid in Finland. And I have a bachelor's degree in computer science from Helsinki University. I did some master's degree uh, studies there as well on usability and some other stuff. And I studied human computer interaction at Tampere University. That's part of my degree, degree also. Uh, this year I've been taking part in Drupal UX team and I've been following uh, Drupal accessibility issues also and I'm also currently the treasurer of the Finnish Drupal Association. At home we have three dogs, four cats, a spouse and a daughter. <laughs> and it's actually also an interesting topic uh, the canine and feline cognition. Uh, but we're not talking about that today. <laughs> so what to expect from this presentation? So I'm not a psychology major. I study computer science. So I have a more like a hands-on approach to the topic. So I'm not so well versed in cognitive psychology. So. This uh, presentation is uh, more or less a beginner's beginner level presentation on cognitive psychology and kind of an introduction to the topic. So most of what I present here, it's something that is available, available in various psychology textbooks. So this stuff is uh, readily available in a lot of different literature. Uh, I'll be pointing out some examples where the theory, or theory of cognitive psychology resonates with web usability, accessibility, or front-end technologies. But uh, we have limited time here, so I won't be uh, going into very much detail here. And uh, unfortunately, part of this presentation has very limited accessibility because uh, it deals with visual perception through examples. So this won't be accessible, unfortunately, for everyone. So I have five parts in here. Uh, part one is called What Never Changes. We are what we are. The Greek philosopher Socrates had the same nerve structure that today the chess master Garry Kasparov has. So in 2,500 years, there is not so much that has changed. The tennis champion Serena Williams has similar photoreceptor cells uh, that the first ol known Olympic champion Koroibos had 2,800 years ago. So we are working with very, very old hardware. <laughs> so the written history is very short time for evolution. Anatomi anatomically, modern humans emerged around 300,000 years ago. And uh, our, by that time, our large and highly developed, uh, highly developed prefrontal cortex uh, started giving us the power to process 
uh, the way the things we sense uh, in a quite advanced way. So one of the things that uh, differ differentiates us from other mammals is our highly developed prefrontal uh, cortex. Uh, but what has changed over the millennia is how and what we do in our daily lives. So we have hardware, but we also have software. Uh, we have certain brain structure, certain kind of cells in our head. In our eyes, we have photoreceptor cells, certain types of photoreceptor cells, and we have certain types of auditory nerves. And this is something that dates back to 300,000 years. And actually, uh, in the recent times, our brain size has <coughs> been slightly decreasing uh, even. Uh, but then we have memory processes. That is something that uh, kind of uh, it can be developed. We have problem solving skills that are affected by how we live our lives, what kind of problems we face. And that's something that's uh, very much different from ancient Greek or from uh, Stone Age. And then there are different kinds of learning methods wha that we can use to improve our cognitive skills. But of course there is uh, much variation between different people, so not all people have the same uh, kind of senses, not all have the same kind of ba brain structure, but uh, that kind of variation has been existing also in the like uh, for a long time. So how do we study the mind? How do we know how our brains work? How do we see things? We have always been interested in cognition. So five <coughs> 500 years uh, before uh, counting of time in Greece, there was a person called Almaceon of Croton, who was the first non-human to dissect bodies and the first one to connect human mind to the organ brain. And the first well-known writing on the topic of topics of cognitive psychology, uh, more specifically about attention, was Sense and Sensibilia, Sensibilia written by Aristotle in 350 before counting of time. And it could be claimed that if Aristotle would be alive today, he would understand uh, web, co uh, web <coughs> CAG success criterion 2.2.4 that's, that's kind of a discusses about how interact interactions can change our focus. Uh, because the topic is there, it's only applied to the web. So the knowledge about cognition has accum accumulated over time. So in 1890, William James, I think it was in the USA, identified that we have both kinds, short-term and long-term memory. And that's something that uh, we uh, still believe. So there is a different short-term and long-term memory. And around the same time in Germany, uh, Wilhelm Wundt uh, used introspection to study human cognition. In the early 20th century, uh, originating from Germany, there was Gestalt psychology that documented many of the current facts uh, we use to, like, uh, when we talk about perce human perception. So different kind of principles. And in 1912, in the US, John B. Watson founded behaviorism, uh, which is kind of a, the other side of the coin to introspection that studies, that's studying external reactions. And uh, behaviorism dominated uh, US psychology circles until the 50s. Uh, in 1956, started something called the Cognitive Revolution. So people start, like there was a group of uh, 
academics who started combining psychology, linguistics, computer science, anthropology, neuroscience, and psychology into what we call cognitive psychology today. Uh, so I mentioned introspection and beha behaviorism. So those, those are two different ways of uh, studying or trying to understand how we think. So introspection is uh, kind of trying to figure out what I am feeling, kind of what, what am I thinking, how do I react myself to this thing. And uh, it's something that uh, kind of ha is some something that is done in kind of a more or less uh, systematic manner. And beh behavioristic study uh, is kind of the opposite. So it only focuses on the external behavior of what some how someone reacts and kind of records the behavior of the uh, subject. And uh, in a way, we have these two ways of looking at usability and accessibility today. So in, uh, for usability and accessibility, the expert, expert reviews are kind of ways of do, uh, doing, the, uh, they are done by introspection. So the expert follows a certain set of instructions or so certain method and stri tries to identify uh, how we, what, what are the problems or issues with usability or accessibility. And uh, there to keep it, kind of it's ca kind of important to keep those uh, uh, different kind of heuristics and different uh, methods so that the result is not too subjective. And uh, for user testing, uh, the tester uh, observes the test subject and that's kind of uh, very much a behavior behavioristic study. So recording like uh, the person did this at that time and keeping track of what was done and then counting how many times or what kind of, so that kind of, uh, kind of external behavior. Of course, uh, usability testing also includes interviews, can include. So uh, valid resu results for behavioristic study uh, require good experiment setup and well-defined tasks and um, good rep rep representation of the subjects. So this is also something that come up, comes up with Drupal when we uh, try to, we discuss, let's say in UX team weekly, set some issues that we think, all, all we agree, we have consensus that this is something like this and uh, we should recommend something, this to be in a certain way. But then we always think, but do we have user data to support this? So we are a group of kind of, kind of uh, experts or experienced people doing evaluation and then do we have data? So it uh, would be very, very nice to have access to all the user data all the time. So, but the cognitive psychology was born uh, in a revolution, and the key, it was kind of a revolution against, against strict behavioralism. Uh, and the key goal was to apply the scientific method to study the human cognition. Uh, so it's, uh, there was, inter so th uh, the idea was to have interchange between, between psychology, linguistics, computer science, anthropology, neuroscience, and philosophy, and there was some uh, important publications uh, at that time that are kind of valid even today in at least in some parts. So George Miller's The Magical Number 7 plus or minus 2. So that's something that uh, most uh, people who are doing usability uh, know that kind of as a Miller's rule or Miller's law. And uh, there was uh, Noam Chomsky's Syntactic Structures and Ulrich Neisser's Cognitive Psychology. And uh, in like uh, in the late 70s, even if there was interchange between different uh, sciences, it wasn't always so that they all interact together. So like neuroscience didn't so much discuss with philo philosophy or compu computer science didn't so much discuss with an anthropology. Uh, there is also different kinds of, so I'm talking about that uh, image there 
maybe the print is a little bit sp small, but it kind of connects uh, which were the kind of connecting signs. Since there is also different and maybe more recent versions of that uh, diagram. So what cognitive psychology studies is human intelligence, language, perception, attention, memory, thinking, consciousness, and learning. And that scientific method uh, defines that uh, <coughs> the we should have descri description of behavior, prediction of behavior, determination of the causes of behavior and explanations of the behavior. And if you're inter interested in uh, like in detail how to, how to study this kind of cognitive psychological behavior, there's this uh, quite detailed article, Experimental Design in Psychological Research by Daniel J. Lev Levitin. Don't, not sure how to pronounce that, pronounce that. That's from 1999. And in cognitive psychology, uh, I think uh, my feeling is that uh, much of the cognitive science publications explains how our minds work in on average. And this is something that uh, usability benefits from and, and user experience benefits from understanding the average users. But when we start uh, doing, uh, focusing on accessibility, we need to uh, understand uh, the extremes. So there is a little bit difference in which uh, publications to read if you're uh, focusing on usability and user experience or if you are focusing on accessibility because accessibility, accessibility needs those extremes. And there are also studies about that, but they are not always included in like uh, textbooks. And uh, the one example is that Miller's law, the magical number seven. Uh, that's a, it's not a strict law. It's not like a laws of physics. It's something that more like idea that we usually, our working memory remembers, can uh, handle seven items, plus minus two. So uh, it's uh, this uh, uh, average. So there, is pe there are people who have uh, cognitive disabilities and who are not working with that seven plus minus two and who have uh, different uh, ways of uh, handling their attention. And uh, for this, uh, the there are uh, supplemental cognitive accessibility guidelines that go beyond WebCAG 2 requirements. So that's also th something if you are doing working on cognitive, cognitive Disability is that something that you can look into. And next, uh, next part is how we perceive the world. So, what we see and what we perceive. So we see. Uh, normally, we have uh, two eyes. We see everything in three dim dim dimensions, and our uh, eyes have a. Uh, two-dimensional retina that receives the image from the three-dimensional wor world. Uh, in our eyes, we have re receptor cells that are rods and cones that convert the image and pass it via optic nerve to our brain. Our brain interprets the image into recognizable object, uh, something we can understand. Uh, so if we have binocular vision, we have a 3D uh, perception but uh, with computer screens, we usually have two dimension images, so we don't have to think so much about three dimensions. Uh, so in our eyes, we have uh, different uh, receptor cells for different colors. So according to the trichromatic theory, we have three different types of cone cells that register different wavelengths of lights. So we have one that's good for blue light, one that is uh, good for green light, and one that is good for red light. So RGB. Blue cones uh, that register short waves are uh, clearly distinct from the 
green and red cells. So they are located on different part of our eye. So then on the, on the outside, uh, uh, like outer ends of the retina and uh, green and red are in the center of our retina. And the trichromatic chromatic theory is uh, comp complemented by opponent process theory that kind of deals with oppo oppo opposing colors and it's kind of complementing theory. Uh, th we have two ways of uh, perceiving our surroundings. So it's uh, top-down and bottom-up processes. So bottom-up process starts from sensory input, what we see or hear. So the environmental stimulation creates sensation and we process that uh, in our brain and then we create like we create this identification or recognition of what there is. But there is also uh, the uh, top-down process where we have expectations, memories and knowledge that uh, affect the how we see things. So we kind of build from, uh, from our expectations. And since we have the top-down process, we must respect the conventions and past experiences and expectations because they affect how the user tries to use the thing we have created. So if we create something that is very new, very like bright idea, very, very good, but if the user is expecting it to behave differently, then it's because of that bottom from that top-down process, those ex expectations. Uh, now, uh, the next part is, uh, I, I go through uh, different gestalt principles uh, that are figure called figure ground, similarity, proximity, continuation, closure, symmetry and order, and good figure. And then there is some later additions that are also called gestalt principles, but they are not from the original, it's called common fate and a common region. So these are things uh, like how our brain processes kind of the, in like processes those sensations, how, how we interpret things. So this figure ground is two ways of seeing. So on the left picture, you can see either see that, uh, you can either perceive that so that it's kind of a, a different way of perspective. So the top part is the bottom, bottom uh, square or the top part is the square above. And in the second one, uh, you either see two faces or you see kind of a chandelier or where you put candle or something you drink from or a vase. Uh, then uh, similarity and is something that shape or color uh, makes you to group, uh, like uh, makes your mind to group things. So on the left uh, image on similarity, you you can see three groups of black dots or three groups of white dots, uh, and you don't so much pay attention into like uh, vertical groups of dots. Then the proximity uh, principle is that if you group those uh, same six by six dots uh, into groups, then you p perceive them as uh, vertical groups instead of horizontal groups, like on the right, right picture. And uh, it's also uh, known that proximity often over overrides similarity in our brain, so if we would have uh, those black dots uh, in those right picture where that's grouped into uh, three groups, then we would still see three groups instead of uh, groups of black and white. Uh, then another principle, uh, Gestalt principle, is continuation. So I have two uh, colors there. Uh, red and blue, and uh, our brain usually interprets so that the lines are co uh, like there is one line that consists of two colors, 
because it looks like it continues. Uh, so that's uh, the principle of continuation. And uh, another principle is uh, closure, so filling in the gaps. So when we have those uh, circle and uh, rectangle that are not complete, so in our mind sees them as complete. Also, when we have those uh, three black Pac-Mans, uh, our brain can see a triangle inside of them. And also when we have those, uh, what are they called, those kind of cones, black cones there, our brain usually tells us that uh, it, there is a ball inside there that has spikes on it. So that's a uh, closure. Uh, then another principle is uh, the principle of symmetry. So we prefer to see symmetrical objects. So where we have the image where we have uh, blue and gray, we tend to see those gray things as the things that are drawn there and that uh, blue thing as a background because of the symmetry and asymmetry. And uh, the next principle is good figure. So we complement simple shapes. So if we have a uh, overlapping red and uh, orange square, like in the uh, top left picture, uh, we think of them as uh, two overlapping squares instead, instead of the pixels we have on the screen, because if we separate them, then we have that uh, kind of, uh, uh, what's that, angle shape and square, but instead we our brain thinks that it's overlapping squares, usually. Uh, then we have that uh, same region uh, principle. That's basically it's a special case of proximity. Mil uh, proximity. So we have uh, one group that that are kind of would be following the rule of uh, the principle of proximity. Proximity. But as we draw those boxes around those groups, uh, then our mind understands that the ones inside the same box, they go together. And then there is this uh, common fate. Uh, let's see. It's a, that's kind of something that uh, usually it's uh, conne connected to movement. Let's see. Yeah, so those things that move at the same time, uh, they are considered to be of the same group, even the if they are in that group, they are kind of random in there. But because they move at the same time in the same direction, we consider them as a one group. Uh, another thing that we have is constancies. So our brain tries to be uh, constant, like you uh, keep these constancies. So there's co co color constancy, size constancy, shape constancy, and lightness constancy. constancy. And there are maybe some uh, different kinds of constancies or, or something that could be grouped here. So such as looking at 3D objects from different angles, we still recognize it, but we don't usually have 3D objects uh, on computer screen. Uh, so the color constancy is something that our brain, brain tries to understand what the colors should be like. So the two pictures there, we have the papers, the, the, the papers the person is holding uh, in his hand, they are of the same color on the bitmap image. But because our the background image is different shade, our brain tends to all like see that uh, those pixels differently. Uh, so the color val values of the papers, the pa like the colored papers, is the same, but most of us see them differently. Uh, also, uh, we have size constancy. So when there is a perspective drawn into image. Uh, we 
tend to th think that the images that are further back on the perspective are in real life bigger, even if they are the same size. So on that image, the yellow lines are exactly the same width, but without those uh, red dots, uh, red lines showing on the image, uh, we tend to see, tend to perceive that uh, the upper red line, uh, upper uh, yellow line, longer than the one in front, because we try to fix our perception because of those uh, rail railroad track perspective. And then we have shape constancy, uh, where uh, we can under like we can uh, understand the shape shape of object in di from different angles. Like we know that door is a rectangle, so if it's if we see that it's a door, uh, if the image we receive in our eyes it's not like flat square, uh, flat rectangle, then e even then we kind of understand that it is a rectangle from a different angle. And then it's uh, we have light constancy. So uh, here on the image uh, we have uh, one square that is marked A and one that is marked B. And the square A is exactly the same shade of gray as the square B. But because it's the square B is placed inside like uh, that sh like a drop sh kind of that kind of shadow thing, then our brain makes us makes makes us think that it's different color because we expect it to be uh, lighter than that uh, dark chest square a also our expectations memories and motives uh, affect how we see things so we can see what we expect to see so that's a very uh, popular old image uh, so uh, so you can either see if you expect to see uh, what is called uh, in the literature old woman facing front uh, you can see old woman with a like large nose and large chin looking forwards wearing a scarf but if you are expecting to see what is called in the literature a young woman you can see a person with uh, like uh, dark, dark hair uh, looking and the eye eyelashes uh, showing a little bit and looking backwards. So you can look at this uh, in two different ways. So it's called young women and old women in the literature, but kind of a not always the best way to describe a person. And then uh, there is another theory that uh, we understand uh, some uh, things based on geometric basic components. So that uh, on the image we have those components called geons, that one of them is cylinder, one of them is box, one of them is kind of this curved thing. So those objects can either make, a, make up a suitcase or a mug. Uh, so that's uh, one, one theory of how we perceive things. And then uh, we, another thing we can sense is sensing audio. So that's a different way of sensing, different nerves are involved. And also it's uh, processed in a different part of our brain. But I'm not talking so much, uh, like not, not in this presentation because of time I'm talking about audio. So it's al also audio is quite important thing. Uh, because uh, there are screen readers and stuff like that, but and also videos and but uh, it's not something uh, we have time to talk now. So what we do with the all the information we have in our mind? So we have like a uh, it's we have a attention. So we need to focus on some things. Uh, and we receive all kinds of stimuli all the time, and we need strategies how to decide what which which of them are relevant. So we can focus on one thing at a time, or we can use selective attention or try to multi t 
task dividing our attention. And there are different theories on how we use attention to process the sensory information through different kinds of filters into our consciousness. Consition, uh, but uh, there are different theories. Like one of the theories is broadband, one of them is Price and Treisman, and then there is Deutsch and Deutsch. But I'm not going to into detail. Uh, one task where we use attention is visual search. So if there is one object that dif is different from the others in one uh, aspect, we can quickly identify it from a group of objects. So we can immediately, immediately see that there is one blue, blue, uh, uh, blue circle there. And this can be done, processed in a parallel mode in our brain, but then uh, when the we need to search something that is has a combination of features, uh, then we need to do processing serially, and then it takes more time, it's more difficult. So trying to find the blue circle from a picture that has red, cir uh, red circles and uh, blue diamonds, it takes more time, it is processed differently. In our memory, uh, we have uh, different parts. So we have sensory memory, we have walking me working memory, and we have storage memory. Uh, so it's kind of we have RAM storage and buffer. Uh, so we have explicit memory uh, that is things where that we consensually remember, and we have implicit me implicit memory of things we know how to do. So this implicit memory also guides when we use websites that we are very familiar. So Drupal admin UI, just go there, click, it's there, there, here, click this, click this. So it doesn't go through all the processing because we know where to move our hands. And then we have uh, that sensory memory that is a brief buffer between working memory and our senses and we keep forgetting from each of the memories. Uh, so working memory can be maintained like about 20 seconds, and working memory is something that we usually process in groups of seven plus minus two, and grouping things in our me working memory, we can uh, uh, extend how, m how many things we can handle at a time, and or kind of uh, using different kinds of taxonomies. And then uh, also we keep the working memory in condition by repeating things internally. And we process visual and phonological information in different parts of our memory. And then the we also have epi episodic buffer that kind of connects our working memory to our storage memory. And we store memories uh, as a semantic net, and uh, so it's co they in semantic net we have nodes and they they are connected to other nodes through node references. So uh, this is kind of how our memory works. And the next part is what can we do with what we know now. So we have different kinds of conventions on how things work, and these conventions are important. And uh, this is something uh, from uh, Jakob Nielsen and Hoala Ranja. So th they have listed a set of things that why we need conventions. So we need to know, we ha need to standards to, to ensure that uh, users know what we just expect, what uh, what the features look like, where to find the features, how to operate them, so and so this kind of basic things, conventions. And some conventions were never really planned, they just kind of happened. And it's not always the best thing to have, best, co best idea to do things, but sometimes not always the best thing idea wins and users can get used to kind of bad solutions or not so good solutions. And sometimes we need to uh, improve 
things to improve user experience. And then I think we shouldn't try to make too many changes at the same time. But when we do changes, when they're good changes, then we need to try to do it so that we can get them to be the new conventions, to change the conventions, not just do one thing at a time. So we can't reinvent re the wheel, but we can design special bikes for specific purposes because uh, we our minds work in a dif different way, but we can try to create new ideas how to do things and create, make them into conventions. So one of the things that was kind of a, it's correlation, but not, not a cause, is the default blue color, color on the links. Uh, so that's a kind of a convention, and we know that blue light is perceived differently. It's different wavelength. It's received in different part of our retina, and we are. It's uh, blue colors affect cognitive performance in certain ways. So there is some research, but that was not based on so much on research. It's more like an intuition, choosing that according to what we know why it was blue. It was kind of, it was. We had limited color palette, and uh, it was something that was uh, practical. So even there is something, it might be something inherently special in per perceiving blue links. Mm, it's co more like uh, uh, correlation instead of deliberate choice. So one of the Gestalt principles was the good figure. So where, where we fill in gaps from what we see and what we think there is. Uh, so tabs kind of use that good figure principle. So we see only see that tabs, but we kind of fill in that there are there is also the content there. We just don't see it, but we know it's there. Th that's something that our mind creates. And uh, grid, uh, grouping things is something that is actually something. So th uh, yeah, that's kind of important to keep in mind uh, when we have these different sizes of viewports and we can uh, re resize the window. So these are actually two examples using CSS grid and uh, very simple one. And uh, on the left one, uh, we can see that the items are grouped A, D, B, E, C, F, but in the same uh, code, when it's narrow, the grouping goes uh, horizontally, A, B, C, D, E, F. So this is uh, the grouping, pr like the pro proximity, proximity uh, principle. So common fate is something that uh, takes place in animations. So we can use animations on website and we can also connect things to each other uh, using animations. But uh, we need to be able to sync the animations, and that's not always easy if we want to use animations to create groups. Uh, so that's the common fate principle. And uh, like for instance, if we in some lazy loading things, there is this loading image that shows that these items are in the same state. Uh, we should avoid too much styling uh, to create uh, like to create similarity. So here I have uh, images of one of them is a text field and one of them is a button. So which one is which? Because there are like the styling is similar, too much si too similar. So we should keep different elements instead of creating similar similarity where we don't want it. And uh, also uh, we for text fields, it's important to have variation because it's kind of a, because of our uh, experience and uh, expectations, uh, it makes this more comprehensible. We can understand what goes where, what to expect. So it helps us to, re to like understand the form better. And also we can uh, quite safely nowadays uh, style input elements with color. And this also can create uh, uh, unwanted similarity between different elements. And uh, also uh, this is something, and because we can var vary the size of the viewport, then uh, we can end up with situations where 
uh, there is uh, connections between elements where we don't want to. So here is one kind of page with accent color, and we can see that it's kind of a, if it's all green, kind of all, only one accent color used for content and that uh, input, then it doesn't really help that accent color. That's something that's kind of could be used with print. Uh, and it could in print we often use uh, accent colors from images or photographs, so different accent colors in different places, but for web that's not a good idea. And uh, also the, as, uh, but here is another example. The colors are not so nice here, but uh, here I, I used uh, different accent color to, ge to uh, get away from the two, uh, similarity of color and also used that, uh, put those boxes that are not always so nice looking, but to create kind of this uh, uh, same container uh, principle. So it's a very, very simple, simple uh, things we can do. And uh, when using color, of course, we need to also bear in mind that uh, the color combinations need to be accessible in different kind of color modes, so in normal and in high contrast modes. So whether beautiful or ugly or just conven conveniently at hand, the world of experience is produced by the man who experiences it. So this is a quote by Ulrich Neisse, one of the kind of architects of the cognitive revolution. Thank you. Um, I think you will be there for questions somewhere around here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for coming. Yeah. And the next thing I'll go be, uh, one of the things I'll go for to see for sure is that how Drupal 10 will make you fall in love with Drupal theming. Because if we know these things, how we, how we see things, we might want to know how to put them into practice really nicely.